My name is Dessa Cosma. I'm a part of the second cohort of DEAL. And the Detroit Equity Action Lab is a program of the Damon J. Keith Center for Civil Rights at the Wayne State University Law School. Uh, it's a program in which we learn about structural racism and ways to collaboratively dismantle that in our workplaces and other institutions that we're a part of. The idea for this event actually came out of the white caucus of my cohort at Deal. The people of color in my cohort called upon the white caucus and said, hey, get your people. So we are heeding that request and that call. Um, and we have put together, uh, collaboratively put together an event tonight that I hope all of you really get something out of. I'm also a part of SURGE, which is showing up for racial justice, uh, particularly a part of the Metro Detroit chapter. There are SURGE chapters all over the country. And our purpose is to organize white people for racial justice. Through community organizing, mobilizing, and education, SURGE moves white people to act as part of a multiracial majority for justice with passion and accountability. So DEAL and SURGE are two of the co-sponsors of tonight's event. In addition, I want to give a shout out to the Detroit Historical Museum, Focus Hope, and Detroit Jews for Justice for also helping us design and pull together this event. It's been a really great team effort. So on that note, you may know that within 24 hours of posting this event, we actually had to shut down registration because it was so popular. Um, you know, we are, yeah. Had to turn away people who wanted to come tonight, which is of course not our intention. Um, and while we wish we could have accommodated all of those people in one, in one sitting, um, it doesn't really make sense to try to cram 500 people in a room somewhere and have meaningful, important, challenging conversations. Uh, so what that means is that we'll be doing some more events like this in the near future, so stay tuned. So why is it important at this moment in time, in this place we call the United States, why are so many people interested in the question and the role of white people in ending racism? Of course, that's a super complicated question. I'm really heartened that so many people are asking. It is absolutely the right question to be asking. And that's exactly what we're going to be dis uh, discussing and exploring together here this evening. For the people of color in the room, we welcome your wisdom and we acknowledge your expertise in dealing with racism every single day. For those of us in the room that are white, here are some initial questions to ponder. What is the role of white people in the fight for racial justice? How can we show up in appropriate, impactful ways? Who can we bring with us? What do we need to learn before we act? How can we be allies to people of color without doing harm to those very people in the process? How can we, as white people, begin to understand that our own liberation is tied up in figuring out the answers to all of these questions? These are not easy questions, and there's not gonna be clear answers, particularly tonight in two hours together. So while there are hundreds of years of colonization, slavery, imperialism, bigotry, discrimination, not to mention internalized oppression and internalized superiority to contend with, there has always been and is today an enormous urgency right now to move forward together to end racism. And it's easy to feel overwhelmed by the nature of our task, but we all have to stick with it no matter what. So with that, I invite all of you to open your hearts and your minds this evening. And I want to share a few expectations with you uh, as we begin our time together tonight. Cool? cool? All right. So here are some expectations from our perspective as the planning team. First one, we have two hours together. We're not going to get to everything. There are going to be major things that we don't even address this evening because there's just not time. This is literally the beginning of a conversation that needs to be continued outside of this room and beyond this evening. Cool? All 
All right. Secondly, racism, particularly structural racism, is not debatable in this space. We are starting at the point of having acknowledged that there is a deep problem in American culture as it relates to race, and that this harms people of color, particularly every day. We are here because we want to dismantle this racism for all of our sakes. Cool? cool. Speak. Thirdly, stay present. For those of you that are white in the room particularly, when we ask you to reflect and dig deep into your mind and your heart later on in this workshop, don't pull out your phone and check your email. What kind of message does that send to the people of the color in the room? If you can't sit and reflect at this event, you should rethink <laughs> why you're at this event, right? P the people of color-led movements have asked us as white people to show up and to do our own work, and we really owe it to them to be reflective and to do our own work. Cool? Cool. Sweet. Fourth, stay in touch with your body and how you're feeling over the next two hours. We are gonna be talking about things that some people in this room have probably avoided talking about or thinking about or have been unaware of for their entire lives. We are going to inevitably encounter feelings, both emotional and physical. Notice how that is for you and let those things you notice give you some wisdom about what your growing edge is. Make sense? Yes. Excellent. Next. The facilitators and panelists tonight are people in our community. We are experts in our experience and in our fields. That said, we speak from our personal experience and our life experience. We're not speaking for entire groups of people, obviously. Right? Yes. Cool. Uh, second to last, we're going to be moving fairly quickly. So why don't you jot down questions as they arise for you if you think of them. There will be a time later in the evening for you to share those with us, but we, we don't actually have the luxury in such a large group of taking questions as we go. And then finally, uh, some of you have heard everything to some degree that we're going to talk about tonight. Some of you, are, this is not going to be new information. Some of you are not going to agree with what we say tonight. I just want to say the fact that you're here is awesome. Plain and simple, it's awesome. And if you continue to have an open mind, this is gonna be an amazing opportunity, no matter who you are, to reflect, learn, and continue on your journey. We have a lot to learn from each other. And one thing to remember on that note is that discomfort is normal in a healthy part of this process. This is not a white caucus, right? You can tell this is not a white caucus by looking around. This is not a time for those of us who are white to take up space in a way that could be damaging to people of color. Um, so there are appropriate spaces for that. I recommend that people check out Surge, for example, if you're white and you feel like you have some um, questions that might be better suited for other white people to help you sort through. Um, we're not going to re-traumatize people of color by asking those type of questions in this space. Cool? All right. All right. So. Those are the expectations of the evening. I'm hoping we're all kind of on the same page about that so that we can uh, learn a lot together this evening. Uh, real quickly, I just want to point to some community norms that we've drafted. Uh, normally, I go through a super democratic process of drafting these together, but honestly, there's a lot of you, and we have two hours. So uh, the, 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 as you listen to this list, um, if there's anything super pressing that needs to be added, we can do that. But in general, I would like I would like your consent on this as our community norms. The first one is engage in active listening. Are we good on that? Yes. Sweet. Uh, treat others respectfully. Can we agree to that? Yes. Sweet. Let's put our phones on silent. Cool? Yes. Sweet. Open hearts, open minds? Yes. Great. Be compassionate with yourself and others. We're all here to learn. Good. Great. Um, make a commitment to continued learning. <coughs> Excellent. And then we uh, phrase, you might have heard step up, step back before, as in don't take up too much space, don't take up too little space. Uh, we realized in my deal cohort that that was a little bit ableist. Uh, it's not everyone's steps. So we decided just to call it move up, move up. Yeah. What that means is be aware of how much space you're taking up in the group discussions. Cool? 
All right. Any questions about any of that? All right. I'm going to pass it over to Rabbi Alana. Thanks, Tessa, so that I can pass it over to Kimberly, Kimberly Kleinhans, who's going to say a few words on behalf of the Native peoples of this region. Muskede Bejike Kwe Dejnakas, Wabasheshi Dodem, Washtenam Dojwa. My name is Kimberly. I'm Chippewa and European. And the words I just spoke were in Anishinaabe Moen, which is the original language of Wawiatanam, which is the name of Detroit originally, um, before the colonizers came. And that's my introduction. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, OK. So am I the only one here who's like feeling a little bit of like anxiety or trepidation about having this conversation? It's like anyone else like, and a little bit, no, it's like, what, just the Jews in the room? No. <laughs> any, any, so like you're all feeling like, woo, bring it on. Yeah, okay, some of us are feeling that way. Okay, that's really impressive. For those of us who like maybe have had negative experiences around this in the past, right? Maybe we've messed up and we've been shut down and that was and that was a hard thing to come back from. I know that I will speak for myself. Like it's I have some feelings about coming into a conversation like this. I think there's probably some other people in the room who have some of those feelings. So one of the things that we like to do, um, in the name of my teacher Sherry Brown, she has us turn to someone next to us and, and offer this contradiction. We'll say, I am so so excited to talk about white supremacy. Just turn to the person next to you. I am so excited to talk about white supremacy. Okay, I am so, I just, I am so glad that we are here to talk about racism. I'm just so glad to be able to talk about racism tonight. And how about, okay, one more. All right, and then we're gonna try this one. We're gonna try love hearing about the mistakes that I make. I love hearing of learning how I can do better. Right? I love that. Okay, okay. Okay. So that was just, that was just a little exercise that we hope you can take with you. That was about kind of re reorienting, right? Because this is hard work, but it's not just hard, right? It's also like um, beautiful. Um, and so I'm just gonna invite everybody to take a moment and think about a person that you love who is in this world or not who would be proud that you are sitting here tonight. Think of one person. And I'm gonna invite you to feel their hand on your back as we take two deep breaths together. about racism and racial justice and the role of white people in dismantling racism. So um, I, I do want to make a note that a uh, beloved friend and mentor, an older African-American woman, said to me when I was discussing this, she goes, Tessa, that's not a concept. That's my life. And I really, I really heard her say that. Um, and so you know, the definitions that you have on your chairs that were handed out ahead of time, 
these are important terms. It's, it's really important to be able to, to use the language, but also like it's so much more than that. It's not an abstraction. So um, pull, pull those handouts if you can. That will help you follow along. Um, and then I'm going to get Rabbi Alana to come back up here with me. Um, and I would also like seven additional volunteers. What you're going to be doing is reading out loud to the group. So um, if seven people could just come up, that'd be awesome, and I'll give you something to read. We're going to have the volunteers uh, that have come up here read a definition for you. We're going to pass the mic down. And after each definition, uh, Rabbi Alana is going to say something that we've all heard white people say in response to these kind of things. Um, and as a disclaimer, I've never heard Rabbi Alana say any of these things. Maybe she has, but um, I picked her because she's awesome, not because I'm trying to make a point to her specifically about making these kinds of mistakes, okay? So um, why don't we start at this end with you? Any of you can read the first one. Yes, sir? Okay. Racism. Racism in the United States is a system in which white people maintain supremacy over people of other races through a set of attitudes, behaviors, social structures, and institutional power. Racism bestows privileges and unearned advantages on white people and denies people of color full and equal access to housing, employment, health care, education, etc. A person of any race can have prejudices about people of other races, but only members of the dominant social group can exhibit racism because racism is prejudice plus the institutional power to enforce it. I worked hard to buy my house in this neighborhood. If not everyone can afford a house here, that's not my problem. So what's wrong with this kind of response? Just shout it out. What is that response totally ignoring? Like what? Structural racism like what? Bank lines. Housing, housing policies, financial policies, access to jobs that pay a living wage. OK, has anybody ever heard a comment like this from a white person who clearly doesn't understand how structural racism works? OK. Discrimination, a showing of partiality or prejudice in treatment, specific policies or actions directed against the welfare of a group. Racial discrimination is treating someone unfairly on the basis of race. Behavior or policy does not have to be consciously biased to be discriminatory. Why is it black lives matter? Don't all lives matter? Who's heard that? Who's heard that before? Yeah, yeah we had a presidential candidate say that. Um, so what's wrong with that? What is that totally missing the point of? Right, so there's all these systems it's ignoring. It's also ignoring that, you know, Black Lives Matter was, was, was sparked by police violence against black people in particular. Right, that's why it's Black Lives Matter. Right, the police were there, who were supposed to protect us, right? Okay. So if you've all heard that before, Seems like we understand why that's a mistake. Privilege. Privilege operates on personal, interpersonal, cultural, and institutional levels and grants advantages, favors, and benefits to members of non-target social groups at the expense of members of target groups. Privilege is characteristically invisible to people who have it. People in dominant groups often believe that they have earned the privileges that they enjoy or that everyone could have access to these privileges if only they worked to earn them. In fact, privileges are unearned and they are granted people in the dominant groups whether they want those privileges or not. Unlike targets of oppression, People in dominant groups are frequently unaware that they are members of the dominant group due to the privilege of being able to see themselves as individuals rather than as members of a social group. I'm poor and I'm white. Colin Kaepernick has a lot more money than me. What is he complaining about? 
This fragility often means that critical conversations about race are not had, cultural and policy changes are not made, and the white supremacist status quo is upheld. But I have good intentions. I'm a good person. I'm not racist. I would never do anything to hurt people. It hurts my feelings that you think I'm part of the problem. Have we, have we been this person? Have we encountered this person? Yeah. I think I, I, and, and we're going to talk in a moment about the journey of, of white racist to becoming white anti-racist. And this is definitely, a, a, I think, a, something that a lot of us can relate to. Um, any thoughts about why this is utterly harmful to what we're, what we're about as anti-racists? It limits racism to things like burning crosses on people's lawns or denying people's jobs, and in reality, racism is a lot more than that. Yeah, right, exactly. So if we only define racist people as people that identify as Klansmen, we're actually leaving out um, most people, and um, we live in a very racist society, which means that unless we're actively fighting against it, we are helping to perpetuate it. I was going to say, what's um, the the focus back on white people again <laughs> and their feelings. Yeah, did everybody hear that? It, it, it re-centers the conversation on the white person's experience, which is detrimental to the experience of the people of color. They're at the brunt of racism. All right. So we have we have two more definitions. They don't have scenarios. Uh, Alana's job is, is done there. Um, but if you could read the next one, that's great. Internalized oppression, the process whereby people in the target group make oppression internal and personal by coming to believe the lies, prejudices, and feedback, so I'm going to move over here, uh, um, by coming to believe that the lies, prejudices, and stereotypes about them are true. Members of target groups exhibit internalized oppression when they alter their attitudes, behaviors, speech, and self-confidence to reflect the stereotypes and norms of the dominant group. Internalized oppression can create low self-esteem, self-doubt, and even self-loathing. It can also be projected outward as fear, criticism, and distrust of members of one's target group. So when I think about this, I think about how powerful the racism in our culture is, that it even makes people of color start believing it. Um, and to me, that's a very good reason to work against racism in itself. allies are people passionately committed to eliminating systems of oppression that unjustly benefit them. The word ally should be regarded as a verb rather than a noun because it has to do with action, showing up, and right relationship. It is not a static reality once and for all achieved, nor is it a label that people with privilege can claim for themselves. People who are targets of oppression determine who their allies are. So I hope all of us that are white in this room are aspiring allies, um, constantly working um, on our own journey, but also collectively and at the direction of people of color to help us dismantle racism. Let's give our volunteers a round of applause. That was a lot of information that we ran through pretty quickly. And if you're familiar with the terms, it, it may not have been overwhelming, um, but hopefully it made you think. And for those that were not familiar with all those terms, I hope, you know, I'm assuming that it elicited some emotion and potentially some discomfort. Unpacking the racism embedded in our culture is a lifelong journey. And if you pull out the handout that has a ladder image on it, this is just two pages from a longer, about 15 page article that I highly recommend reading. It's a woman named Tema Oken who wrote this piece, and her piece is called From, From White Racist to White Anti-Racist. And she writes about the different stages that white people go through as we develop awareness about our relationship to racism. And we don't really have time to run through the whole thing, um, but I do just want to point out a couple of things. And, and like I said, I, I highly recommend looking up and reading the article. This ladder is something that's not really linear, right? 
Um, if, you're, if you look at the bottom and you move upwards, moving upwards on this ladder um, takes a lot of time and a lot of intentionality. It also requires a lot of self-reflection and building strong relationships with other white anti-racists as well as people of color. So we can't really, as white people, necessarily skip wrongs on the way up. We have to go through and internalize a lot of these feelings in this process. Um, and I actually just thought, you know, maybe that sounds like, well, okay, I'm gonna hold my, <laughs> I'm gonna hold my own thought about that. But so, we, you know, we can't necessarily just skip or skip up, right? We we need to go through them um, before before they really sink in. But what is very true is that you can be feeling like you're acting um, maybe on the third from the top rung, and then something can happen, and you realize you're right back down at something else that you're really not proud of, right? And that, this is why it's so incredibly important to stick with it. Um, if we you know, make a mistake, or we get called out, and it hurts, up, it hurts our pride, and we slide back down into some defensive, blaming state, we need to analyze that and reflect on that and keep at it. Um, it's too important for us to flake out because our feelings got hurt. Um, and also, there's no arrival point. It's not like anybody here tonight uh, on the panel or in this room that's white has arrived, right? We're not like permanent allies, right? That is, so, you know, it's, it's different. It, it's, it's counter to our cultural norm to think that, like, you never get where you're trying to go. But, but the fact is, like, this is a life's work, and this is a life journey, and it requires constant vigilance and attention. Um, and that's just the way it is. And if that sounds too hard to you, ask yourself why it's too hard to you. And what's at stake if you don't actually do that? Any quick questions about this ladder? Hopefully, if you read the whole article, it can help you understand the phases that you may be feeling or that you may be witnessing in other people. Um, and can and help, you have, help you have compassion for yourself when you do make a mistake and give, you, give yourself some uh, incentive to keep going. All right, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Lindsay from Surge, who's gonna walk us through a self-reflection exercise. All right, everyone, so now we're getting to the reflection that Dessa mentioned earlier. So we're gonna give you a little time for some uh, silent self-reflection before we get started with our panel. And then we'll also give you a chance to share a highlight of that reflection with someone sitting nearby afterwards. So there are a few questions we have for you that can serve as prompts, and they're hanging around the room. I'll also read them now and right before we get started. So you're welcome to think on any one of these or all of them. One question is, why do you think you're inclined to show up at an event like this? A second question, what part of who you are made you come tonight? What is one meaningful thing you've learned about racial justice on your journey? And finally, what is one question you have going into this workshop? So we'll give you about 10 minutes to think on that, and then I'll check in with all of you again and give you a few more minutes to share. So we invite you to jot things down, journal, sit quietly with your thoughts, whatever your preference is. And I will read those one more time before you all get started. So again, why do you think you are inclined to show up at an event like this? What part of who you are made you come tonight? What is one meaningful thing you've learned about racial justice on your journey? And finally, what is one question you have going into this workshop? Turn to your neighbor and share one highlight um, that you had during your reflection. And I'll give you just a couple of minutes to do that, so please do be mindful of the time so both people get a chance to share. Later, but right now it's time for our our awesome panel. Um, I'm excited 
to bring these fine folks to you. I'm sure many of you know them already from all of their work in various communities here in Detroit. Um, to my far left is Dr. Peter Hammer. He is a law professor at Wayne State University and the director of the Damon J. Key Center for Civil Rights. Welcome, Peter. Uh, next to Peter is Tawana Petty, who is a mother, an activist for social justice, an anti-racist organizer, author, and poet. Welcome, Tawana. Sam Magdaleno, who is the director of One Michigan for the Global Majority, uh, which concentrates on immigration issues, but also collaborates on an array of social justice issues. Samantha is a third generation Detroiter and a graduate of Wayne State University. Welcome, Sam. And finally, directly to my left is Julia Cuneo, who goes by she and her, and who is part of Metro Detroit's Surge Action Committee. Welcome, Julia. So over the next hour as we hear from these panelists, I invite you all to jot down personal reflections that you may have through the course of this conversation. I think we're gonna hear some really interesting stuff. And I also invite you to write down questions that you may wanna ask of us. Um, total transparency, we're not gonna take questions from the audience. Uh, it's a large group, there's a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of time. But what we will do is follow up with everyone who signed in. There's gonna be a process for following up to, to answer lingering questions and to provide additional resources that you guys identify that would be helpful. So that's what those sticky notes are for. At the end, we'll get those from you all and be able to follow up. Sound good? All right, great. So the first question is, anyone can take first, but the question is, on your personal journey, what is one of the most important lessons that you've learned about yourself and what you can do in service of racial justice? On my personal journey, um, it's taken a long time for me to realize what exactly my role is in fighting um, for racial justice. And the reason why is because, like a millennial, I thought that I could do everything. And the more work that I've been doing, the more exhausted that I've been coming. So what I realized is, is that everybody has a different role in this movement. Everybody has a specific job that they should be doing. And me, as an indigenous Latina woman, my job is to educate my fellow people of color, the global majority. Um, it is not my job to educate white people on their own racism. That's white people's job. So part of the reason that I'm here today is because I actually knew that there were going to be people of color in the audience and that the fellow global majority were going to be here. And so all of my responses are directed towards those folks. My responses are to let you know that it's not your job to address these white folks. When you see them making these racist comments about Kaepernick taking a knee, when you see them making racist comments about uh, Latinos and Muslims, that's, that's not your place. Um, too many times I've burnt myself out handling white people's aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers, grandma and grandpas on Facebook, and that really is the job of an ally. So my role, my thinking has been for me to self-care and make sure that I'm helping my people directly. be short and I'll, I'll piggyback off of what Sam said and say um, one of the questions that I often get um, which has caused a lot more reflection in this work for me is um, is this question about uh, you know it's difficult for me to have these conversations with my grandmother or my aunt or my uncle or my cousin and um, you know and I don't know how to have those discussions or I'm afraid to have those discussions and my response is if you're running from the discussion, then that means I have to run from the terror. So you're running from the discussion, and I'm running from the person who's gonna try to murder me because you wanted to run from the discussion. And so the thing that I'm learning 
uh, have learned is to push back against that, which I didn't always do. Um, and I, I think it's very important. I mean, you know, um, that similarly to um, say I'm not necessarily using these types of spaces to human, not to try and appeal to the humanity of white people, I would say that um, similarly, uh, I think that these spaces are an opportunity for like right now, I'm gonna say we modeled something. That's another thing I learned. We modeled indigenous. I say, Sam, go first. You're an indigenous person on this panel. Pass the mic to me. And then Julia and, and Peter, Professor Hammer, can determine which panelist goes after that. That is difficult. It has been difficult to assert even something like that in these spaces. And so that's another thing that I'm learning is like to step up and say, you know, this is this is a discussion that I'm going to assert my leadership in and the people that I want to be co-liberators with, not allies, but co-liberators with, are the people who are willing to take my leadership in something that I know something about, which is my oppression as a black person in America. And so that I would say that that's another thing that I've learned. Hi everyone. Um, first of all, my body chose today to have a cold, so I'm sorry if I'm stuffy or out of it. Um, so when I reflected on this question, um, I thought about two sort of pivoting moments for me. Um, I liked the phrase that Dessa used earlier about um, discomfort, growth edges, right? Um, so there were two that specifically came to mind for me. And the first one was when um, I learned to stop elevating myself from other white people. Because I grew up in Detroit. I grew up with a fairly liberal family. I never had um, that one person who was I needed to call out or, or that. So I thought that my family was exempt from some of these systems. Um, and definitely was able to sort of use that to be like, well, I don't really have any work to do then, right? Um, and just sort of like get over that bump. Uh, and, and force myself to do the work. And I hope that everyone in this room is, is at that space now because you showed up. Um, and so kind of opposite from Sam, I'm speaking directly to the white folks in that space because um, I've been there. Um, and then the second moment was when a friend of mine uh, who is an indigenous organizer said, you know, you don't even know who your family was before they were white. You don't even know what trauma they went through to get to this space where you're white. What did you give up? You have none of that language, none of that culture, um, and you don't know what kind of person you would be if you didn't have whiteness. Um, so that's been sort of a, a new transitional space for me now, is thinking back on my own family's history um, and what, what that would look like. I really resisted that at first, um, and I'm still sort of building my knowledge of that. So uh, definitely still making mistakes, definitely still learning. I'm really excited to be in conversation with all of you. So good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a real honor to be sitting with these panelists, and I really want to thank Des and all the organizers for the hard work that they put together collectively. Um, the Detroit Equity Action Lab is, is probably the most exciting thing I've ever participated in, uh, and to kind of see that take its own energy and leadership and uh, assert this, this power that, that is here in this group, I think, is, is really exciting. Um, we're all on different journeys. I, if I were to sort of hold out a, a, a lesson of sort of hope and, and possibility, particularly for the white folk here, um, I started this work in terms of racial justice pretty late in my life and career. I, mean, so I, mean, I was doing different social justice issues and doing international work, uh, but not dealing with kind of racism at home. Uh, and that's a very different problem to try to deal with. Uh, and so those people that think they're either too old or this hasn't been what they've struggled with or uh, it's too late, uh, it really isn't. I mean, this is really, in my mind, the most important struggle of our generation uh, and something that we need to enlist everybody in. Uh, and I certainly share this notion that the fight against white supremacy has to be fought by white people uh, and that it won't be won and it won't make any progress uh, and it will continue to reproduce itself uh, unless uh, white people take the lead. Uh, and it starts within our own inner circles. Right? It starts with our friends. Uh, it starts with our family. Uh, and I'll just be honest with you, that's the hardest 
set of conversations I have to have. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, the joke, um, different things is, you know, you don't talk about the war. Right? So we spend all of our lives not talking about these things, not having these conversations. Uh, it's a lot easier for me to come to Detroit and work with Deal, uh, who are, you know, filled with wonderful, like-minded, motivated, you know, brilliant leaders, uh, than sometimes go home for Thanksgiving. You know? but that's the struggle, but we, we accept that, right? And that should be increasingly unacceptable. Uh, and is hopefully the sort of, of, of events like this start to highlight that uh, and really thank everybody here from all different backgrounds coming out uh, to recognize how important that challenge is for everybody. So knowing that there's a lot of different experience, many, many, many different experiences on this panel, Tawana, I want to start with you and ask, in all of your experience, what specific things have white people done right in your uh, in work around social justice, and what common mistakes do you see people making? And therefore, what advice do you have for the white people in this room who are striving to be co-liberators, as you say? I think, um, I think right is such a loaded uh, word because we're still like totally in the midst of uh, racial violence. And I think that it's been such a short um, history. I mean, you heard some of the history, you, like you heard some of the history in the room today uh, about like 1950s being like the first time that like non-white immigrants could even immigrate to this country of free will. And so like, so it's just a very short, short, short window of even pursuing something like equity. <laughs> um, and so I would say that we're moving, I, I would say that I have um, folks that are in my corner, I would consider you one of them that are moving, Julia, one of them, Professor Hammer, that are moving in the right direction. Um, but I think that um, I think that in order for us to identify the work as being right, we'd have to be free and we're not free. And so I think that, um, I think that one of the, the um, Give me the second part of the question. I think that I would say, I would say one of one of my biggest, and this isn't even just isolated. Like I think that this is a big mistake. Period in the struggle against uh, racism. I'm going to use my, I'm using I statements from my perspective. Is a common mistake is this ally word in the, in the privilege word, and uh, the reason why I say that is because. If we recognize that the system of white supremacy is harmful and violent and is something we need to dismantle, then we cannot, cannot say that people who have more of that system are somehow privileged over us. I think that the closer you are tied to white supremacy, the further dehumanized you will become. And whiteness is an ideology that people have decided that they're going to accept as their identity in order to benefit from that system. That is not a privilege. Um, and that, the, you know, and I know that that's a, a new way of thinking, but it's very important that, that we internalize that because the only way that we're gonna really dismantle racism and dismantle white supremacy is that if we don't use hierarchical language that says that we want people to say that they are somehow further along than we are. And so I think that that's a mistake in anti-racist organizing, and I think allyship is an optional opt-in that makes people of color and black people pet projects, and we need to move from being allies into co-liberators and recognize that all of our humanity is tied into dismantling this system. of racial justice. <laughs> um, I'm probably the most brutal, honest person that you'll ever meet, so I'm gonna be really brutally honest and say that I haven't seen too much of it. Um, but there is one lady, her name was Deb, and she did a co-anti-racist uh, training with this guy, Tony Richard, black guy. And Deb said, I know that I'll never get it all the way, ever and I'm always going to learn from people of color. 
and that really resonated with me because she hit it right dead on because I'm tired of hearing white folks tell me I, I get it I get what you're going through I get what you're feeling I, I understand it I, I watch it on the news I, I read about it and I hear it all the time uh, these so-called liberals, they tell me, I'm, I'm on the left, I'm with you, I'm progressive, and they throw out these terms that are supposed to somehow comfort me, uh, all the while when there's a thread going on Facebook and somebody's calling me, uh, you dirty spick, and they're like, oh, but that's my best friend and I didn't want to say anything, they really just didn't know. Um, so white folks admitting that they're never gonna get it is one of the best things that they could do. Um, white people, and this doesn't happen very often, but white people using their privilege to actually give in to a person of color and realizing that these are hard conversations, especially for people of color to get up here and talk about these things. And this is stuff that we've had experiences with our entire lives, yet, Nobody's giving us a paycheck for this. Nobody's paying us for our knowledge and our education. We're just supposed to teach white people for free and give it to them for free. And then when it becomes a cool topic, all of a sudden, white passing people, because that's also a thing. There can be people of color that are white passing, that are multiracial, but they start using their skin color to their advantage and all of a sudden they can talk about equity and they can get paid and I don't. Um, that's a very common mistake. Another common mistake is the whole nonprofit industrial complex that really needs to be addressed. Yeah. Well, the nonprofit is receiving money off of my pain, off of our pain, bringing money in, money in just to do what they want us to do. And what they want us to do is to perpetuate oppression and not really liberate anybody because if you liberate anybody, then they don't have a paycheck anymore. These white leadership people coming into our neighborhoods and taking these executive director positions and taking the directors of youth positions in my people of color communities and staying there year after year after year saying that you're saving me. That's a huge problem in our communities. If you really wanna work with us, then train somebody to take your spot. Say, you know what, there's nobody else for this ED position, but I'm gonna pledge that I'm gonna be here three years, five years max, and then I'm gonna hand it over to this expert or the community because they know their community more than anybody else. I'm not gonna stay here with these youth, I'm gonna teach them. And last off, silence plus neutrality equals oppression. When white liberals cover for each other, when I go to them and I say, you know what, this kid that you gave money to in this white organization, whether it's Student Power Network or whatever other organization it is, he messed up, he disrespected this person of color, and I need you to address it, and they start making excuses. Well, he didn't know, he's new, he's this, he's that. No, he's messing with my community, and he's messing with this kid's money, but you don't wanna say anything. Those are all things that are messed up. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of trouble with this first question as well as far as what white folks do right. And I think a big part of the reason is that sometimes you can do something so right that it turns around and becomes wrong. Um, so I think about the humility that I see in Surge, um, specifically, and, and the ability to say, I don't know, which I really value in us, and I value in a lot of allies. Um, but then I also see that getting in the way of our ability to do the work. Um, we wait to be perfect. We wait to be all-knowing. Um, I see us being you know, ready to, to hand over materials and power and supplies, but sometimes too ready to abdicate the responsibility to question who's in leadership. Um, so I wanna say maybe uh, what we can do right is, is constantly be ready to have been wrong um, and constantly get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, and the biggest piece of advice that has really helped me um, is learning about 
the ways that codependence impacts my uh, work as an ally. I actually don't call myself an ally ever because it kind of implies like I'm in someone else's fight. Um, and I feel like this is very much a fight for all of our lives, for my life, for my humanity. Um, so it's not a word I use often. But just to stick with that language because it's what we've, we've been using, um, white society, white supremacy, teaches love in a very codependent way. It teaches that in order to love someone or something, you have to own it and control it. Um, if it gets mad at you, it hates you forever and you're a bad person. Um, and so one of my fears, uh, and I think one of a lot of our fears, is being wrong. Uh, because we want the person who tells us we're wrong to then walk us through that and make us feel better about being wrong. Um, but when we learn to love in a way that is not selfish, um, and to love uh, in this much more open way, and we recognize uh, what is triggering that fear of being abandoned, that fear of not having control of our relationships, uh, we can get a lot further in accepting our faults and healing from them. Um, so that's, those are sort of the two areas that I was, was reflecting on with this question. You know, I think about things that you can do right, or at least aspire to do right. Uh, one is to listen deeply to people who are sharing their experiences and views, uh, even when it's not consistent with what you were taught before, your life experience, or uh, the way that you were sort of trained to see the world. So I think it's very important to, to, to listen to Tawana and Sam, and even if it challenges my beliefs about my work or my role, uh, or the role of, of institutions or, or people that I know, uh, you have to get used to that level of discomfort. And you have to be able to, to, to disassociate to some extent of, of the models and beliefs that you've had before. Uh, and then you have to trust the people that, that are teaching you. Uh, and I think there's a, a lot of instruction. So I think if you're inspired to do that, you're at least on a path to, to doing more right. Um, I think it's also nice there's a lot of ensembles here, right? And, and kind of the structural critiques are important. But I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the personal mistakes that I've made using our eye voices in trying to do this work. Uh, and they may be more generally shared, so you might, you know, sort of think about whether you have done some of these same mistakes. Um, but uh, I'm not always a good listener, right? Uh, so am I, am I listening to people? In, in a deep way, not just sort of a, a superficial way in ways that I don't just hear what they're saying, but I can really try to empathetically understand uh, what their feelings are, what their perspectives are, what their experiences are. Um, uh, white people like to control, right? So in a situation, uh, there's a huge desire uh, to want to assert control, right? Uh, and that's not in, in, in sort of just one direction, it's particularly there when, when something starts to go wrong or tension starts to arise. Uh, the way you assert control is you want to fix the problem, right? Uh, and you want to make everything all right. But you can only do that in a very, very superficial way when you're dealing with these incredibly deep sense of, of tensions. Uh, so it's a mistake to want to kind of either or interfere and, and, and cut somebody off or try to uh, resolve a, a tension. Uh, and, uh, you know, white people don't like to have black people and other people of color be angry. Right? And that kind of notion of uh, wanting to deal with other people on your terms. Right? Well, well, I'll work with you if you behave. Right? Uh, I'll work with you if, if you're nice. Uh, and I think we have to sort of see how deeply ingrained those sets of beliefs are uh, uh, in our training from when we were uh, being born and raised and the lessons we learned from our families and the lessons we learned from our schools and the lessons we've learned from our society. Uh, and a lot of this work is a, a lot of deep internal uh, reconstruction uh, of the way that we view the world uh, and the way that we interact with others. Uh, and that's not easy. Right? And as I said before, as, uh, as Dessa was saying, that's a lifelong struggle uh, and something that people have to always be attuned with and, and working with. Uh, but I think if you start to sort of be introspective in your own experiences, you'll see some of these patterns. Uh, and once you can start to recognize some of these patterns, you can start to change your behavior. Right? And you can make different choices and different decisions uh, about how you're going to behave in a certain space. Uh, and we can all learn. Right? Even us old people can learn. 
uh, and uh, that it takes practice. But it also takes people being honest feedback, right? So I mean, the, the, one of the best things you can have is is just you know friends in the struggle who are willing to be honest with you uh, if you're willing to just listen. and Sam that communicating with white people is, is not something, um, convincing white people about the existence of racism is not something that's a worthwhile use of time for them. Um, I certainly respect that. And so feel free to opt out of this question. But the question is, what techniques do you use to communicate with white people who are unwilling to acknowledge that racism exists or that is a pervasive and serious problem? So if, if maybe Peter and Julia wants to start off with that question and see who's interested in answering. <laughs> I'll just say at this point, people who just fail to acknowledge that racism even exists, I can I can I can accept acknowledging that you don't understand the ways or you you know you don't know the difference between institutional and direct or you don't feel like you're you know you don't feel like you're Implicit in it, but at this stage in the game, if someone was to tell me they don't think racism exists, I, I wouldn't even waste my time on them. Like we at least have to. Like I like how you started this room. Like we're going to start from the point of acknowledging that it's a thing, and that's where I'm at at this point. If I can. Um, yeah, I definitely feel the exact same way. Um, I'm a person that's on social media a lot, so I get a lot of attention um, for what I say. So before, I definitely would go back and forth, but now I, uh, I tag certain people. So I tag this guy Gavin, Laura, Pastor Jack, and Petra. These are all white uh, co-conspirators who have proven that they're on their way and that they understand things. So as soon as I tag them, they're like, yo, I'm in, you're out, I'll deal with this. and." Um, how it goes. And I think too, just to clarify part of, the, part of the point of this question, which uh, is there are white people in this room that are related to people and have to spend time with people who are really not even remotely on this journey. And I think for those of us who encounter those people in our lives, like it feels like beating our heads against a wall sometimes, you know, and so that, that's the genesis of this question is Maybe people in the audience have some ideas too. We can talk about it afterwards. Like, how can we begin to chip away at people's unwillingness to acknowledge this? Okay, so um, I think the way that this question is phrased is a little bit difficult to handle because the first thing that is important to acknowledge is that anyone who, in this day and age, says I don't believe racism exists is a racist. Um, that's the first step, right? Like you have to acknowledge there's a problem. Um, and the reason I say that that's important to acknowledge is not because it's fun to call people racists, although it can be. Um, the reason I say that is because I could spend hours banging my head against a wall trying to convince them that racism exists when they know full well that it exists, they are it. So for me, those conversations, it doesn't mean don't have them. But be very clear in your mind about why you're having them. Be strategic. Um, what are you going to get from this person? If it's absolutely nothing, then the conversation is not for that person. The conversation is either to build your own power so that you are a stronger communicator and a stronger ally, to build your community so that the people around you watching you argue see that there are people in opposition, see that there is resistance, and join you in your fight. Or to basically push back on this person and make them shut the hell up, right? So those are kind of the three reasons you might want to argue with someone who is just flat out unwilling to listen to you. But you don't do it to change their mind. And the lucky thing about racism is it, it doesn't require that we change every racist's mind. We have to get rid of their ability to enact their racism. So if we dismantle the systems that allow them the power to, to be racist, um, we get rid of the, the systems of employment 
and the systems of capitalism that keep them able to discriminate and able to enact violence, then they can think whatever the heck they want. And they can do it alone in a corner with no friends. <laughs> so just being strategic about this conversation, we have to be having it, but we don't have to be having it to change their little racist feelings. I slightly redefine the problem. I mean, there, there are particular individuals that you either can or can't work with. Um, but I want to sort of think about what, what tactics or techniques we might have to deal with broader populations. Uh, you know, you sort of think about the way societies are structured uh, and now commuting patterns exist where, where, where people can just live in these enclaves uh, and don't have personal experiences. Uh, and the broader social media and history and, and mythology in the country uh, really anesthetize white people to the, even the existence sometimes uh, of these issues. Or they make it uh, obscured, right, or, or hidden or less obvious. Uh, and then the question is, how do we think as a community strategically about waking some of them up, right? Shifting some of the beliefs, uh, altering some of the consciousness. Uh, and one of the techniques or strategies that we use at the Key Center is, is really to get people to understand how systems work, right? And how opportunity is created by systems and how opportunity is denied by systems. Uh, and uh, the story or the sort of little exercise we did in the beginning trying to, to, to defeat the myths, right? That uh, Rabbi Alana sort of forced to read uh, in terms of those statements. Uh, and, and some of this is sort of storytelling and, and letting people know the history that they're not taught in high school, right? That sort of uh, wonderful insight of the, the person who raised the question about immigration laws, right? Uh, you go back even further, you didn't need anything to come to this country if you were of the, coming from the right countries. Uh, you just showed up, right? There's no visa, there's no application, there's no line. So when people are, you know, sort of instinctively saying now uh, as a reflex that, you know, we all came to this country in the right way and in the right way, well, they, they just don't know their own history, right? Uh, and so at least we can be there to, to tell of, of, of the real history, reveal the honest history. Uh, there's a great book by Ira Katznelson of, of When Affirmative Action Was White. Right? Uh, and is detailing other things that people in this room were bringing up earlier, uh, just about how every New Deal program was absolutely racialized. Right? So you can't point to anything, Social Security, uh, the housing policies, uh, and the logic right? so to, to explain to people uh, is because the FDR needed the Southern vote, and the Southern votes for Democrats, and they wouldn't vote for any New Deal policy uh, unless it was expressly uh, constructed in ways that would deny its ability to deal with uh, African Americans, right? So you can walk through, and you can then see systematically how these policies created a white middle class, right? And it was the systems, and it was policies, and intentionality. Uh, and as an educator, I have to believe somehow, right, that uh, that uh, uh, telling these stories, educating people, framing things, drawing attention to systems, uh, is a way to get people to start changing beliefs. Because right? a lot of the, the, the evil and the fallacy of racism is it's focusing on uh, these sort of false narratives of individuals. Right? It's saying, don't look at the big power structure, don't look at the systems, don't look at the history, uh, look at this individual. And I think we, as part of a, a strategy to counter that, uh, we have to be willing to, to educate people about the function of these systems. So I wanted to add one more thing, um, just listening to, to my fellow panelists. Um, a technique that I used, and again, it wasn't directly towards the white racist, um, but it is important to talk to them even if they're not willing to have the conversation or they're not at that level. Um, when President Trump was elected, Royal Oak Middle School started chanting, uh, build the wall, build the wall. And there was one Latina student that recorded it and put it out, and she started being targeted in her school. So the students of my organization were appalled and angry and disgusted. So what we decided to do was we took about 20, 25 of our youth to a Royal Oak basketball game we took our shirts that I'm wearing now, do I look illegal? We took our Mexican flags and we started cheering for the Royal Oak basketball team. 
and we started cheering several chants, and one of them included Si Se Puede. And at the end of the, the game, when it was all over, uh, we started chanting, build bridges, not walls. And it was a bunch of our students. And the reason we did this, again, was not to change the white people's minds, but to let that student know that she wasn't alone. Because nobody else was going to this school, and nobody else was having these conversations. Thank you. So thinking about some of the common mistakes that uh, we've all encountered yeah, sorry. Uh, thinking about all the common mistakes that many of us have uh, encountered when having conversations about race and racism, one of the things that I know comes up a lot is people, uh, and this came up in the scenarios earlier, white people lifting up other parts of their identity and saying, yeah, but I'm discriminated against too, right? Um, I'm gay, or I'm disabled, or I'm poor, and, and, and obviously, <laughs> I'm some of those things. So like, you, those are real, right? And, and they, they do cause discrimination and harm to people. It's not to belittle those things at all. But I have noticed that one of the things that, that white people who are uncomfortable acknowledging their role um, in our racist society and in perpetuating that is to step away from their white identity and, and pick up their targeted identity. Um, I am on a learning path of that myself as a disabled person. So what do our panelists say? What is it, you know, what would you say to a person, a white person who is picking up another part of their identity, lifting that part of their identity up, uh, rather than owning their privilege as a white person? Now I can't use the word privilege without thinking about Tawana. <laughs> then it worked, right? <laughs> um, I would say, I, I honestly, I would say that um, racism is a disease. It's a disease, like alcoholism, like drug abuse, like any other disease that is literally eating at your insides, right? And um, most times when we're inflicted with disease, we're in denial about it. And so we deflect. And so I think that um, racism needs to be tackled like that. Um, I think that there needs to be, um, and you know, I, I talk about this all the time. It's very important in this movement towards liberation and co-liberation that white people understand and recognize how much their humanity and livelihood is tied up into dismantling racism. Because if we continue to move from the perspective that dismantling racism is a thing that just helps black people and people of color, it'll always be an optional thing that people can opt in and opt out of. And that is, that's one of the biggest harms to this movement, why we haven't moved very far, why we keep revisiting the same thing every 50 years, um, because uh, there isn't a, a brave acknowledgement. I won't say some people don't acknowledge it, but there isn't a, a, a large enough acknowledgement of the impact that racism has in the white community. The people that are jumping from buildings and leaving their children behind because they can't live up to the backwards values of the pursuit of the American dream. The people that are, are dying fist over hand by drug abuse in the white community right now. There's a hush, the domestic violence, the murder-suicide, the same trauma that white supremacy inflicts on black people similar different ways because there's institutions and systems that back it in the black community like militarization and things like that but white white the white ideology has internalized white supremacy so much that at your very detriment not willing to acknowledge it and so you can either watch and watch people continue to die and families continue, continue to be brutalized and humanity continue to be diminished or you can acknowledge in the mirror and say racism 
is destroying my humanity. I do not know my culture. I do not know my identity. I cannot connect with my neighbors. I have to step on people's necks to get where I'm going. Drug abuse is infiltrating my community. My, uh, you know, I'm suffering from domestic violence and suicide. My kids are running from the family because they don't want any parts of this anymore. I mean, there's a lot of things within the white community that need to be looked at that are a direct result of the system of white supremacy. And that is the deepening of the anti-racism work that we need to do. So it isn't something where you can say, I'm not a racist, I don't feel like I have to deal with black people. You have to deal with white people and, and how it's killing white people, first and foremost. different approach. Uh, I don't have a general approach of how I, uh, I take this question. Um, I make everything really personal. I'm not a person that's like, oh, well, I'm going to generalize this, and some people do this, and some people do that. No, I'm more of a person that if I'm having this conversation with you, it's because I somewhat know you. I've allowed you into my life enough that I'm having this conversation with you because again, I usually don't have this conversation. So I must have somewhat of a little bit of a, of a respect for you. So I'm gonna look at the camera right here because uh, Graham, this is to you. Graham is a white owner of Elk Club in Southwest Detroit. He's a gentrifier and he's also a gay man. And when we talk about racism and we talk about oppression, very frequently, Graham brings up, but I'm a gay guy, like I know what, how it is. No, Graham, no you don't. <laughs> You've had a plethora of handouts to you your entire life, and now you're going into my community and you're making a lot of money off the backs of our community. So what I do is I tell Graham all the time, shut up and listen. Listen to what I'm telling you because you can hide that identity of yourself. As a white gay man, it's not very easy to be able to say, oh yeah, that guy's gay. In cer certain circumstances, definitely it is, but I can never rub this off. I can never take a break. A lot of people talk about self-care in this movement and Sam, you just need to take a break, but I can't. White supremacy is literally everywhere. Even if I want to sit at home and watch Netflix and relax, what do I see? White faces, white faces, white faces. I turn on a movie, who is the criminal all the time? It's not the white person. It's the people of color all the time. What do I see when I'm represented in movies? I'm the maid. That's pretty much what it is. And that's not acceptable. So when I'm talking to people and they start bringing up their other identities, I start talking to them about what I have to deal with. And I tell them, shut up and listen, because I'm very direct. And if they don't want to have that conversation, then they're not privileged to the education that I'm about to drop on them. Um, so everything that Tawana and Sam said um, is also true about, you know, we're having this conversation now and we're gonna, we're gonna have it, like you're gonna listen. If you're asking me these questions and you're bringing up your target identities at this point, we're gonna talk about the toxicity of whiteness. Um, and so echoing all of that and then only to add that um, it's important for me as a as a person who studied a lot of this stuff, to realize that this response is not simply an ignorance. It's not simply some lack of knowledge that I need to fill a hole and they'll just switch behavior. It's a defense mechanism. You know, it's a strategy to avoid thinking about something painful. Um, so, like Sam said, um, there is no one strategy for dealing with a defense mechanism. When someone has been traumatized, um, and they are trying to avoid a difficult conversation, you can't force healing on them.
through your you know five step plan. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give you a um, one word answer that's just gonna make it disappear and they'll be on your side. Um, but trauma happens through relationships. It happens through community, and so it can only be healed through relationships and through community. So for me as a as a um, ally. Uh, I'm going to build that relationship from there, from where is your trauma, and then how can I tie your trauma to white supremacy, because every single one of our target identities comes from white supremacy, and is tied up in white supremacy. Um, my experience with this uh, strategy is through feminism, uh, because I'm a gender studies minor. Uh, so my conversation would be, you know, white womanhood doesn't exist without white supremacy. Um, all of the sexism that, that I complained about as a young feminist um, comes from the oppression of black women, comes from the need to elevate white womanhood. Um, the pedestal that I complain about um, cannot exist if it's not on top of the back of a black woman. Um, Southern white supremacists made that very clear. Um, so, Starting from that space of a relationship, I can relate to you and I can relate your complaint and your trauma back to this white supremacy, because that's true of every single target group. Class, disability, uh, the heteropatriarchy, all of those things are white supremacy manifest. So that's where I would start. I like the way you talked about this being a strategy, right? And if, if it's a strategy, then you need counter strategies. Uh, and I think if you just sort of reflect upon how this conversation at the very beginning was framed, uh, it was to remove the defense mechanisms, right? It was to prevent this kind of thing from coming up in this context, uh, but to put the conversation in the frame two or three layers deeper to permit uh, a much uh, a more effective and profound and hopefully uh, effective conversation. Right? So, and we can all map these out and do this collectively and say, well, what are the five most common excuses? Right? And then when those are shot down, what are the sort of three backup ones? And then what's the two that come after that? Uh, and then you have to sort of think about how you counter that as a strategy. Right? And some of that you just start outing it. Right? And, and, and what did we do with, with Rabbi Alana is we put that out here, right? And then we rejected that, right? So we're sort of going through this process of saying, we know the chess moves, right? We know the, the and it is a defense mechanism, uh, but it's often a conscious defense mechanism. Uh, and what we have to be doing is being strategic in our own conversations to, to get people to be three layers deeper uh, and to just sort of blow through those defense mechanisms uh, to permit a much more honest conversation to take place. Uh, and, and again, we can all map these out. The more we do this strategically, right, we can have fun doing it, right, and if you can kind of create the culture with starts to making fun of these things, uh, then they disappear, right, and they're not used. Uh, and I think that's the kind of notion that we're thinking of, of, of evolving this not just as a one-on-one -on -one dialogue, but as a movement, right, and changing not just uh, one person's uh, opinion, but rather uh, the opinions of entire sections of society. Uh, and I think, again, sort of reflect about the intentionality of, of the designers of this tonight, you kind of see uh, how that moves can be made and the way in which that can then effectively open up space uh, that these other defense mechanisms are trying to, to shut down and deny. So, we have time for one more question. Um, so I want to ask the panelists if they can each share with us what they think the ideal behavior of white people is in social justice work and as it relates to racial justice. Not a big deal, right? So we'll uh, take the, the advice. 
Um, first, I, I think again, we can. It, it is important to deconstruct questions, right? To take a question, but also not to to think that the question is is all in one form. When I say the notion of ideal and whiteness, we're already sort of mimicking uh, a lot of sort of sub themes that we want to be outing. Um, but I want to say, how can a white person show up in this space and, and, and try to do a decent work? Um, one is willing to be vulnerable. Right? And I think you've seen before that these are complicated, difficult questions, and uh, I don't know the answers to them. Right? Uh, uh, you don't know the answers to them. And starting out uh, acknowledging what we don't know and we haven't done, uh, and the growth that we need to do is, is a, a space that one can be to start doing that type of work. Uh, I think in that space you have to, to work in a team. Right? I think the deal work is effective because we have a great team, of which Mama Lila is there, so we're sort of letting her uh, do her work uh, uh, in this setting as well. Uh, you have to have uh, that kind of team. You need a diverse team. Right? You need uh, to be willing to follow the lead of others. Right? You need to be willing to listen, as I said before. Uh, and then you need to show up. Right? We've sort of had this sort of notion of, of people uh, being guilted into coming into a meeting and then when the guilt fades or the crisis goes and the news cycle changes to something else, uh, then they're back to their old routines. Right? And, and, and people have been burned so many times, they're expecting that. Right? that uh, so at the end of the day, what you have to do is, is, is be there right? again and again and again uh, and show up because you're part of this community and as you're saying, you're co-liberators. This is all of our fights. Uh, but those are some of the, the things I would say that one can aspire uh, to do if one is trying to, to do better uh, in this work. Um, so I think first and foremost, again, I'm going to challenge the question. Uh, I don't know if you're noticing a pattern. I tend to do that. Um, I think we need to stop thinking there's an ideal behavior and that if we just follow that path, we'll be... Uh, out of all the guilt and all the pain, it'll just end and we won't be, ever be questioned again. Um, and that the, the search for an ideal behavior harms our relationships more than it helps them. Um, the, the desire to never be wrong again hurts us more than it helps us. Um, but that I too am sick of people showing up after some tragedy and then never seeing them again. Um, I too am sick of people who show up to a meeting and don't want to listen first, um, who come to our meetings at Surge and say, well, what are we doing? I want to get stuff done. I want to start. What's our, what's our work right now? We really need to get to work. This is the time. Um, and, and who don't want to stop and think strategically and learn themselves and, and practice reflection. Um, this work requires a period of testing, a period of um, stretching your muscles and growing in yourself uh, that lasts for a lifetime. Um, so, so that, I, so I just want to say there is no ideal behavior, and and um, the sooner we get comfortable with that, with being wrong often and regularly, uh, the better. as you see them. You can't be afraid to get electrocuted or burned because um, when you don't fight the fires, they come through like ravaging our communities and, and murdering and killing and assaulting and incarcerating and brutalizing and, and, and preventing us from, from uh, you know, living, thriving and surviving. You know, and I, I would think also it's time to start doing some homework on these, some of these institutions, these banks, these mortgage companies that tell black people and people of color that they can't get a loan, but yet every ounce of wealth that that bank has established is off the ancestors, slavery, and indigenous murder of uh, people of color and black people communities. And so when, I, when, you, when you're in a, in a discussion um, 
with other white people and they say something like black people need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps or you know they need to you know if they had just worked hard enough then I would ask you you to sit down and that'd be a research project y'all take on together and find out how many of the institutions that folks got their loans and their mortgages from that were not earned uh, unfairly earned off of slave labor and black labor and indigenous culture. And so I would just say ideally start doing the homework, start having a conversation, start putting out the fires before the arson comes to us. All right, so my ideal behavior of a white person as it relates to racial justice all right, I got a whole list for y'all. All right, so first off, um, my ideal person is somebody that listens and takes direction, that asks us what we need and what we want instead of assuming. Um, an example I like to use is you got a white ED that moves into a neighborhood and they get $100,000, $200,000 and they look on the street and they say, oh, well, there's a lot of potholes, so I'm gonna put all this money into prepare, uh, repairing these potholes. But if they would have talked to the grandmother on the street that's been living there her whole life, she could have told them, well, if you would have fixed these lights, we could have avoided the potholes and reduced some crime in this neighborhood. You need to take direction from the experts in the communities, and this is why it's so important that these white executive directors and these white directors of these nonprofits take a step back and realize when it's time to hand over the reins to somebody in the community and not staying there forever. It's really important that when we see these white executive directors that are harming our community members, such as Ryan Bates from Michigan United that did Jose Franco and many other people in this room by taking credit for an ID victory that he did not do, but behind closed doors sent an email to foundations and said this was our work and then got a grant from Fisher Foundation to continue that work that he didn't do in the first place. A lot of people, a lot of white allies knew that this happened and they stayed silent. And they said, well, we, we battled with him on X, Y, and Z, and nothing happened. But then you stopped. And when you stopped, I had to look at my youth who went door to door in hot weather and got over thousands of community surveys for these IDs to push for these IDs. I had to look at moms in the eyes 50 to 60 that we got in the spare of the moment to go not only to the hearing but also to the vote and I had to look them in the eyes and say you did all this work and a white man took credit for this and he continues to take credit for this and he continues to go and play Monopoly on every single struggle and I'm glad y'all are here because you're, you're shaking your heads because you know exactly what I'm talking about but I need more white feet folks to start shaking their heads with me because y'all know that this is happening and it continues to happen. And then it discourages people. I lost two of my youth this year that said they couldn't do it anymore. They've been with me for the past three years and they said nothing changes. These people in these powerful positions, nobody puts them in check. These foundations keep giving them money and money and we get nothing. These same youth that decided to come and get trained in community organizing instead of going to get a job and helping their moms feed their younger brothers and sisters, doing this stuff for free, while these executive directors get to go to their big lavish houses in Ann Arbor and never have to see Southwest Detroit when the street lights do come on. Uh, <laughs> we do.
Exactly, 100%. And understanding that we don't get space. So when Asha so bravely comes to my back and reminds me of something that I definitely needed to bring up, that she's not taking up space and she's not taking any, she's not stepping out of bounds because we're not given these spaces. This is the first time that I've been in a space like this, that I've had this many white people show up. And just last Saturday, I had an oppression training. I had an accomplished training. Three of my youth showed up. None of our white allies, co-conspirators, accomplices, whatever you want to call them, none of them showed up. And this is the problem. We have to put white in the title. We have to have white people advertise it for white folks to actually come out. We can't continue doing this. And to be honest with you, we need to address the white fragility and we cannot stop talking about it. I don't care how hard the conversation is. I don't care if it's your grandma, if it's your grandpa, if it's your uncle, if it's your brother. Because Dylan Roof, he was somebody's brother. Dylan Roof was somebody's son. Dylan Roof was somebody's friend. And people died because nobody wanted to have those conversations with him. So when something's inconvenient for you, when something hurts your feelings, that can cost me my life. That can cost my family members their life. These hard conversations need to happen and they need to continue to happen and we can't dance around it and say, uh, the white people in power, the white people this. No, we gotta put a label on it. Why is Ford Foundation giving out money to people of color organizations and expecting them to jump through roofs uh, hoops for this money, but yet Michigan United is getting money on the side and they don't have to go to any of these meetings. They're not stand held to the same standard. This is stuff that we don't talk about. This is stuff that I've held for three years and I didn't talk about when I was working for my nonprofit, but I can't do that anymore. We can't be a part of these systems and not say anything and just sweep it under the rug. If we're sweeping it under the rug, we're not really doing this work. And when you and I are in the same room, white people, and you're looking at me in the face and you're telling me that you're with me, but yet you know that this is happening and you haven't said anything or you said something, but that enough was enough, you're not with me and you need to do more. And that's all I gotta say.
learning that you that we had we were privileged to receive tonight what are you going to do with it and what are two things that you appreciate one for yourself and another thing for, for someone else in this room turn to your partner if you can hear me clap once you can hear me clap twice it sounds like people are making a lot of commitments awesome to one that wants to share i just wanted to add one more commitment and I should know, and you know, these panels, they're never long enough to say everything you want to say, but start looking up your abolitionist here, uh, history, too. Like, you, you all don't just have horrible races in your history. You also have John Browns in your history, and so if you want to start channeling somebody to mirror yourself off of, start mirroring yourself off of the people that really stood up against racism and took out whoever did. Okay, so I, I'm just going to be real. It's going to come to that. If we really are going to transform this society, the only thing, at the risk of sounding, however, um, black people, the people of color aren't the only ones who have to sacrifice their lives for this struggle. And so you start looking up some of the history, the people in your history, who literally put their lives on the line to fight against racism. Because you have those too. And so I would say, start channeling Conversations, not just having conversations for, you know, um, like what's the next event I'm going to organize or those types of things, but like who in your history can you channel, get somebody's hand on your back that literally laid their life down to fight against racism. And so that, you, that, that really needs to become a thing. It really, so uh, uh, it, with the guilt and the understanding and the acknowledging the privilege that so many still are going to do, um, I, and, 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 and wanting to be an ally, when you start moving towards wanting to be a co-liberator, pull up those people in your history, and that's going to take you to the next level. Please show up to our search meeting on Sunday. We have so much trouble getting people to continuously show up. They come up to events like this when there's been a, a national trauma or uh, some horrible event. Uh, if this is, is a passion for you, if you want to do more and think more, come to the meetings. Just show up for a few weeks in a row and then commit and, and work with us. Um, anyone can do it. You do not have to be an expert. We will not hate you if you don't know what you're talking about. Come to our meetings. The next one is this Sunday, uh, 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock at the MOCAD. Uh, it's the first and the third Sunday every month. So come to me if you want more info, or talk to Dessa, or talk to Lindsay. Um, last thing, um, Sam is amazing. Can we all agree on that? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> more amazing and, and she brought everybody she goes everywhere with like a whole posse can you all raise your hands because they're all amazing like these folks up here wearing the shirts they're they're brilliant <laughs> she doesn't say enough about how brilliant they are um, and she has a pay pad so if you could all take out a pen and paper um, and just write this down for yourselves for next time you have some spare money to give to an organization that does amazing work and needs the funds um, and deserves it and will do real work with it. It is. You ready? Donate, D O N A T E, at the number one Michigan, the whole word Michigan, dot org. If you need that again, come talk to me at the end and I'll give it to you. This is a, I, we can all vouch for this organization being an amazing place to spend your reparations funds. The at symbol. Thank you. Um, so, like I mentioned before, I do various trainings in Southwest Detroit. Um, they're open for everybody. And my main target is um, Latinos of Southwest Detroit to learn how to do community organizing and to learn how to really speak up for themselves and to empower themselves. Um, so I have about 20 different trainings that I do that range from uh, social 
social media training, surveillance training, oppression training, and everything else. If you uh, text one Michigan and you spell it all out, O-N-E Michigan to the number 77543, you can get a text update and it'll tell you the time, it'll tell you the place, the address, and all of that stuff. And um, we usually give it about a week in advance and then also the day before and the day of. So again, you text one Michigan, all spelled out, to 77543. Um, we do ask for a $10 donation uh, for accomplices or co-conspirators that come to each of the trainings um, just because you're entering a safe space uh, for people of color. Uh, so thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. If you have lingering questions, we're going to have a flip chart up here to post them and we'll try to follow up. And if you have requests for additional resources, please put that on a sticky note too. Thank you so much for coming.